appreciate your serving as conduit. Um, okay, so let's uh, let's talk about models and and the relationship. To this. Um, my comments here, as in so many comments for this boot camp, I'm going to try to make them more than about the implementation actually using any logic versus any other package and more more conceptual in the structure. But then I'm going to dive down and talk about how to achieve these things in any logic uh, with particular mechanisms, both as illustration of this and because some of you are hoping to develop facility in that platform. And um, uh, I want to give some understanding. Of this. But it's really important when people come to dynamic modeling, um, they, they often are puzzled by the relationship between data and models. I related a story, I think, in this very boot camp about a colleague years back who, um, who cautioned in a meeting, which is not a colleague I knew well, but I met her, I think, one, one previous time, and she cautioned, you know, we cannot only use models, we have to have data. And the point is models help us use data better, but what are the particular interfaces between model and data um, is a, is it is the question of what the interfaces are? Characterizing those interfaces has some texture to it. Um, and I've listed here a couple of ways that models interface with data. A couple of different ways that models engage with data. And I'm going to comment on them. Um, and I'm going to comment on them with a particular eye towards how they apply in agent based modeling. So, one is direct model parameterization. We spoke just a couple of days ago about um, the uh, division within a model between endogenous factors and um, uh, exogenous factors and ignored factors. Okay? Um, so um, uh, right here. And you may recall that endogenous factors are the things generated by a model. Exogenous factors are the things we tell to the model. They're represented in the model, but we, we tell them what to assume. And as we've been building models through this boot camp, we've been imposing exogenous assumptions on them, often in the form of values of parameters, an energy expenditure coefficient, a preference for convenience store meals for for, for a person and for a given population, et cetera. So we've been encoding assumptions in our models, often in parameters. And, you know, in a industrial strength model, particularly a model over here, sort of going off the edge of the world, but over here in the empirically grounded area of the space, you know, Quite a lot of our data is, is sort of goes into model parameters, parameter or something. Um, in some of these more stylized models, you put in plausible ranges of parameters that sound okay, but over on here on the right hand side, you're you're typically trying to have evidence-based um, data for particular parameter values. And so a fair bit of data just goes into informing those choices of parameter values in some way that's not arbitrary. That's ground. Um, and so direct model parameterization is, is one way in which we inform our models with data. There's a second way, which is kind of a close cousin to that. It's a, it's a close relative of that. Um, that should just say indirect, um, indirect model parameterization, which is basically, we don't have data that will directly go into a parameter, but we have data related to that. And by transforming that data in a certain way, we can get the data that will go directly into the parameter. And this is sometimes called backing out. It basically involves taking data and, and either with light assumptions or some basic assumptions that are stated explicitly, deriving a value for a parameter. So um, maybe we have data that's phrased as um, 
uh, as uh, proportions, and um, we want to turn into absolute numbers, and we know the total size of the population, and we can multiply it and get that back. That'd be a sort of particularly simple case. Um, in other cases, um, uh, we inform the model with data in a fashion where the data doesn't directly inform any one parameter. Typically, this is for data which is emergent in the world. And we, and we try to inform the model with that by adjusting our assumptions about model parameters such that model behavior best matches these observations from the world, this data from the world. So the data here is not something that tells us about any one parameter. It, we don't have data about parameter X, parameter Y, parameter Z, but what we want is a model whose behavior, whose overall emergent behavior is consistent with that data. Um, think about COVID cases over time number of COVID cases that are observed over time. That is not, that is affected by people's contact rate, um, people's mixing, but you can't just take COVID case data and turn it into an estimate of contact. You cannot just say this implies this contact rate because it, it, it involves many other things, reporting rates, you know, whether people were wearing masks, whether they were vaccinated or not. It, there's many things tangled up in the equation of what leads to the observed case. Rate. And so we can't just take it and turn it into a parameter for one parameter. But what we can do is expect our model to match it fairly well. And that may allow us to tune values of parameters where we don't have direct data such that the model matches this observed data. Yes, remember. So it's interesting. My, one of my colleagues does a lot of this work in decision trees and this kind of stuff. I've done a fair bit of that myself. Combine that with dynamic modeling and, and other work. And, and she does too. Um, but you know, she said for her, one of the big things that was an eye opener when she came to dynamic modeling is that in risk analysis, there's a lot of emphasis that's put on to parameter estimates, estimation of values that go into these decisions. And people who do risk analysis are focused on that data. And you know, they feel really uh, at a quandary sometimes if um, uh, data is missing. You can do sensitivity analysis, but the, when they're thinking about how data engages with the decision tree, it's putting it in input assumptions of that decision. But she said one of the big things for her, eye openers to dynamic modeling is that you can use data a lot more flexibly than that in dynamic modeling, because not only are the parameter assumptions things you want to inform, but you can calibrate the model by taking data that can't be reduced to any one parameter and matching up all against the model against it by adjusting assumptions about parameters. So data interfaces with dynamic models in more general ways than say in a decision tree. Um, and this is something people often don't understand who haven't worked with dynamic models. Most of our data cannot go into parameters, but it can inform the model parameter assumptions by adjusting model assumptions so that it adequately, it does adequately match this other data. There's a more advanced set of techniques that are called filtering techniques. Um, some, some of you may have taken my system science boot camp or my system science class, Fields Institute, a systems and data science class. And you may know that um, there are these techniques which don't just form parameter values of the model like calibration does, but they, they adjust our understanding of what the current state of the model is over time. They, they update our understanding about what's the current situation. Over time. And then finally, data is used to sort of challenge, the model, to help sometimes the years or quarters in certain areas of modeling validate the model. Um, I think it's more accurate to say falsify the model or challenge the model 
but it's used to build um, uh, build uh, better mental models on our part to help us learn if the model's off base, to learn from that and adjust the model, or to build confidence. Um, so model engages with, with data in, in many ways. And I prepared some slides here, but I, I really want to get into some of the nitty gritty. Um, uh, again, some people here will have seen this. Um, calibration is about parameter inference, and we're going to dive into that. But just be aware that these days, there's a whole bunch of other techniques which broadly can fit into the machine learning area that bring together model, so dynamic model understanding with data. And these are more sophisticated techniques that estimate the parameters of a model, think MPMC, approximate Bayesian computation, or they, or they estimate the state of the model, the current situation in the model, constantly regrounding re it, recorrecting our understanding of that state over time, um, like some of these here, particle filtering, particle MCMC, common filtering. And some people here know that we've advanced those methods a great deal and, and, and they're using this. Okay, um, so I want to go into some details on these things, but because there was a little bit more interest expressed in this in some of the pre-surveys, um, I do just want to offer some, some comments on like sources of parameter estimates. So, you know, often we draw sources for parameter data for models from a wide variety of sources. Uh, sometimes we have controlled trials that are relevant, um, where they are ethical and possible and feasible and, and affordable, et cetera. Um, and, you know, the time has been enough to conduct them. Um, there may be certain cases where we have surveillance data or, or outbreak data, which provides parameters for us. There are cases where that might be possible. Um, um, uh, there, there are times where, you know, there might be clinical reports about how long it took an individual to stop shedding infection after, after uh, symptoms were first reported, for example, which would provide us estimates for, for parameters. Um, and outcome studies from interventions might, in some cases, provide this information. But often our sources for parameter judgment, parameter values, sometimes have to be informed by some expert judgment as well. Um, so we, we have someone who's an expert in the system or areas of the system provide you know, suggestions for this. And, and you know, there are times where administrative data might give some understanding of parameter values. Um, as well, um, so the you know the fraction of people um, with diabetes uh, with with a diagnosed case of diabetes who also have diagnosed heart disease or something like that if, if that that ends up being important. so often in modeling papers you'll see statements of parameters and they'll often state you know a source of the assumption some of these are other models some of them are are based on primary data data sources uh, such as those listed here. Parameter values come from a variety of areas. In the ideal world, we these will come from things like meta-analyses, systematic reviews, et cetera. And there are times where we have that like the systematic review or that can go into parameter. It tends to be a smaller subset of parameters for many models, but it can happen. It can happen. Um, Often, so so here's this is a subtle point, and it's one I've rarely commented on. This my or my students will say because my students could really benefit from hearing this thing sometimes. So uh, I I speak a lot in these boot camps and elsewhere, particularly in my teaching full semester courses, about the difference between models, dynamic models which capture positive causality. They're not perfect. They're learning tools that may help us correct our understanding over time. They, they have a postulated condition, you know, causal pathways, generative pathways. I talk about the difference between those and association. Association of models, 
we try to exploitate commonly in regression, try to tease out how variations in outcome variable you know, depends on, uh, in, a, in a covarying sense, on variation in, in different covariates, you know, explanatory variables. And that's good. We, we see how they covary together, the degree to which you know, uh, variability in one might, might be associated with variability in the other. But these are associations. They're correlations. They're not necessarily causal. And there's a wonderful surge of work recently on causal statistical models. But most studies published in the literature um, uh, that involve, you know, uh, uh, multivariate analysis of outcomes, for example, are not uh, are not causally based on causal models. They're they're based on association. And and yet sometimes we use this information in our model. I remember having a substantive discussion with Sandro Galea. Um, and uh, Liz Brook was party to that discussion as well. Um, and, you know, you might think it's strange because I talk about the importance of having causal, positing causal relationships in these models to examine counterfactuals. We want our models to be able to examine counterfactuals. We want our models to be able to ask what if questions in ways that, that, we can answer that in a way that reflects the causal structure of the system as we pause it to be. And that requires a model that represents causal relationships, not merely association. If it was associational and we intervene on the system, you know, the data generating process may be altered and the association may be totally different. Um, if, if we were trying to predict outcomes, if we were had an associational relationship between overdose deaths and, you know, availability of, of um, needle exchange programs and supervised injection sites and peer support programs for, for quitting individuals and, you know, a set of other harm reduction measures and, and you know, pharmacy um, monitoring, prescription monitoring programs, et cetera. If we were to do an associational analysis, we might find very big associations. But the question is, are they causally significant? Um, because if we were to say, okay, we'll intervene by adding a new supervised injection site, that association might change because it is a, it is a result of a data generating process that's now different. Um, and so we look for in our models, causal relationships because those are generally conserved. If we change something, the causal structure is the same and we see the outcome. Um, we, we've just changed a part of the system and it ripples through the system along the same causal path. That's the idea. But what I'm saying is we consume data that is produced sometimes for parameters through association studies. And there's nothing hypocritical about that because often the thought is that um, well, the system as a whole is a complex system um, in a way that generates data, and we need that causal structure to be positive to reason about intervention outcomes. Often the analytics that's done to tease out relationships are at a much smaller scale, where um, in a way that might not be modified by the what-if scenarios examined um, that we're interested in examining, and uh, where we may be dealing with more stable relationships. And uh, you know, those smaller scale relationships involving you know, controlled statistical studies for certain factors are um, you know, statistical control over, over other, fact, other confounders. Um, you know, we believe that they're unlikely to be jeopardized by the what if uh, scenarios that we're interested in, in analyzing. So just be aware that sometimes these, these analyses that go on here, um, uh, that, we, that form the basis of um, parameter values come out of associational analysis. And that is well accepted within the modeling, uh, in the modeling space. Um, okay, um, I wanna talk about sensitivity analysis. This is a key factor within analyzing models. And it's hard to get a model published 
without conducting sanctions. People will generally kick it back and say, look, you haven't done due diligence. You haven't done your job. You haven't been really serious about this. You try to publish a model and you haven't altered the assumptions and see how model behavior is off. You haven't been serious about dealing with the uncertainty. If you're going to publish with models, you need uncertainty. You need sensitivity. Um, and the observation is in a nonlinear model, you can have profoundly different degrees of sensitivity of the model outcome um, on different parameters. For some parameters, it may be extraordinarily sensitive, sensitive in this current situation. Some very little sensitive. Even in a linear model, you can, you can get those effects. But over, in a nonlinear model, as it changes over time, those, those sensitivities may be different. So sensitivity analysis is a key step in identifying sensitivity. And in agent-based models, um, we have to be particularly concerned about or be particularly aware of sensitivity with respect to stochastic. Um, so I'm going to come back to this point, but I'd like to walk you through a little bit of discussion on sensitivity. And this is going to be involved hands-on discussion. So what I'd like you to do is if you call up any logic, that would be great. And I'm going to call up some slides here on sensitivity analysis. We're going to be opening up one of the example models here. Okay? And I'm going to show some principles. Sensitivity analysis is key step to understanding uh, the uh, how beholden certain model outcomes are to to parameter assumptions or structural. So, um, in order to do this well, I think I'm going to stop um, uh, stop my recording and, and start start. Again, so here we go.